thank you all for coming here this evening. Um, so I'm really delighted to be here at the Tate Modern Lakes to discuss with my elder brother, Davy Jose, how he explores his spinal injury through his artwork. So Davy's artwork has been exhibited around the world, both physically and through award-winning virtual reality films, uh, from exhibitions at the British Library to film festivals in Korea and New York. His work is actually also profiled by the BBC on television the last couple of years. So Davy's um, work exploring the spinal injury, inclusiveness and access has had a diverse audience. So my name is Bobby Seagull, and professionally I'm a school maths teacher, but some of you might recognize me from University Challenge, and since then I've gone on to present BBC shows like Monkman and Seagull's Genius Guides and a Channel 4 quiz show, The Answer Trap. But for today, I'm here in my capacity as Davy's younger brother. Um, so Davy's current ongoing series uh, called Living with Spinal Cord Injury was actually first exhibited at the National Spinal Injury Centre in Stoke, Mandeville. And if anyone's like a pub quiz fact collector, that's the spiritual birthplace of the Paralympics in 1948. So in fact, so growing up together, in fact, ever since I remember, uh, both of us spent hours drawing and painting. But obviously, Davy took it more seriously than me because he's exhibiting here, I'm just doing the talking. <laughs> Um, Davy's art is actually based on his lived-in experience of disability, in fact, your first-hand experience of inclusion and access, and how it shaped your early life. So, Davy, can you start by setting the scene for us and tell us about how your spinal injury started your journey into art? Uh, thank you, Bob, for the very kind uh, and generous introduction. So, look, at the age of 2.8 years old, uh, I was run over by a car uh, and, and sustained a spinal cord injury. So, I spent long bouts of stay in hospital, uh, in the early 80s at the spinal unit. And so in the hospital in the early 80s, there's nothing for children to do. So the doctors and nurses would basically give me pens and papers, and I basically spent my time drawing and painting. And for me, drawing and painting became sort of deeply intertwined with my rehab process and recovery while I was in hospital. So even though I started drawing in hospital, I continued it when I went home. And so let me show you a slide. So this is a uh, photographs from uh, actually the early 90s, but later on, but when I was drawing in sort of the hospital ward during Children's Week. But you can see in the background, the other kids have got their priorities correct. They're playing Pac-Man while I'm drawing. Yeah, that, it's a rare sight nowadays to see people all watching the same screen. People tend to be glued to their phones nowadays. So again, if you do use your phones, feel free to use social media and tag us in. You can see our at handles there and hashtag Tate Lates. So a key theme of today's Tate Modern Lates is about inclusivity and access. So Davy, you had your own experience with this, obviously. So let's chat a little bit about inclusivity and access themes and how they were key in shaping your sort of life adventures after your early hospital days. And that's where you discovered your art through rehab. So what happened like after those early days, Davy? Yeah, so look, in the early days, I was at the National Spinal Injury Center, as Bob was talking about. So this photograph is from the mid 90s, you can see a nurse retired recently and she gave me this photograph. It was actually me with her on the front of the Stop Mandeville annual account. So this is a new picture to me, I only discovered it the last few years. But look, after my initial uh, stays in Stop Mandeville Hospital, I started a uh, special school in the early 80s. And so in the 80s, uh, we didn't really follow the national curriculum per se, because the focus of the school was more about physio exercise, how to feed yourself, how to move, and basic things like that. And so what I did was I spent most of my time in school painting and drawing, and also the school had lots of BBC micros for some reason, so I got to learn programming as well. And during that era, sort of I discovered one of these really old watercolors that I did of Bob actually back in the day. So yeah. I thought I'd throw that in That's here. Cool. Am I reading a maths book, a quiz book? Well, I, I like that jumper. I missed that jumper from my childhood. Um, so Davy, you didn't follow the, I guess, the formal national curriculum, and then you transitioned from Elizabeth Fry to Eastley Mainstream School. So what did it feel like going to mainstream school and why was that sort of integration and access important to you? Yeah, so it's very random how I got integrated into mainstream school for my special school. So very randomly, my special school in East London called Elizabeth Fry School got burnt down in an arson attack. <laughs> it wasn't you, it wasn't him. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't me, as they say. So, so the insurance money went to a mainstream school called East Lee Community School. And so for, luckily for me, they used the money to build a lift. So this is my first proper experience of access. And this is when I realized from a very young age that for disabled people, 
to integrate into inclusive society access was very, very paramount. So for me, this is something very, very novel in the 90s, uh, where access and inclusion wasn't really great. So long story short, I started this mainstream school and I was a bottom set for everything. Uh, but then art gave me the confidence to tackle other subjects at school. And so before I moved to the mainstream school, these are some of my friends from the Elizabeth Prize school days. And you can see a BBC micro in the background as well. Unfortunately, I'm not in this particular photograph from the newspaper, um, but yeah. You can pretend one of them is you, pass it <laughs> exactly. off. Um, so, like, um, so this inclusion, integration, and transition to mainstream with access is also key for you, Davy. And remember, when Davy was younger, and I was younger, I was like better than Davy at all subjects. And eventually, he started clawing his way back and beating me. It's obviously a bit disappointing for me. Uh, but you ended up coming top five in the country in computer science A level. And then fast forward in time, you actually ended up reading maths and computer science at Trinity College in Cambridge. And these are opportunities that you might not have had without access to that mainstream schooling. And it all started perhaps with that simple lift Absolutely. at Eastley. And you even got to know, quite jealously, Professor Hawking. Like, tell me about, a little bit about that. Yeah, so yeah. while I was going to Cambridge and stuff, and even before that, I got to know Professor Hawking. But most interestingly, you know, the reason I'm bringing it up here is that a lot of our discussion was about physical access to things and inclusion. But I'm guessing that that's a story for another talk completely. Okay, I'm, I'm going to sign up for that talk. <laughs> Um, so from seeing firsthand how your artwork evolved and given our surroundings here at the Tate Modern, it's really like fascinating to highlight how your work exploring spinal injury actually grew from your love of art history, especially one of the most sort of renowned polymaths, Leonardo da Vinci. In fact, like both of us are big fans of art history and every time I got a question on art history on University Challenge, I was like, particularly happy uh, David would approve of that. <laughs> so can you tell us how you use art history as a gateway to explore your spinal injury and themes like inclusiveness. Yeah, so look, Bob, I've always loved uh, Leonardo da Vinci's anatomical drawings. Like, I remember growing up with you um, in East London, we had a lot of books looking at the illustrations, and what they, the drawings, and this is from a bit later on, last few years ago, I went to Queen's Gallery, they had an exhibition of his drawings. Uh, and so what, what, they, what the drawings reminded me was of x-rays I had seen of myself growing up mm -hmm. in the Stop Mandel Hospital. So just a bit of some context. So separately, whilst integrating into mainstream school and then going to university, um, I sort of usually publicly ignored my spinal cord injury. I tried to be, quote, normal, because I felt disability was uh, not, not safe in, the, in outside my safe spaces, such as my special school or like the medical setting. So my focus was always focusing on the art, the technology, the programming, the maths. But then I started creating this oil series of looking at inside the human body uh, which is inspired by da Vinci and x-rays I'd seen on myself. So what I was slowly converging to was exploring the human body, particularly the disabled body, and the damage caused by this disruptive injury. So I'm just going to show you some of these paintings. And you can see this is uh, actually uh, physically in real life behind me as well. And you can see they were inspired by x-rays, the, the kind of the profile of, 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 of the neck and head. And here is some more. Uh, any surgeons in the crowd will know what these things are. Uh, what, yes, some more here. So look. So, okay, so look, essentially, this is for me, in a way, to address the elephant in the room, uh, uh, which is uh, um, through my art and make it accessible to others to engage it in. I didn't necessarily like talking about it, so I painted it instead, which basically had, which led to discussions about disability and spinal injury. So through exploring my spinal cord injury, I was able to embrace it through medically inspired artwork. So look, one way, ways, one way how society looks at disability is called the medical model of disability, meaning that you're disabled due to the disability diagnosis of one's body and that it needs medical intervention. So reflecting back, these canvases were focusing on one specific way of looking at disability, but of course there are other ways too. Mm. So like essentially you were exploring your spinal injury with the medical model of disability as you call it. But unless like, you know what you're looking for, you might not know that it's spinally uh, injured anatomy. Isn't that right? Uh, that's exactly right. So look, what I realized by doing these like, drawings, I was kind of like hiding the disability away by not making it direct. And I didn't want to do that right, anymore. So what I thought was, let me try to normalize disability in some way, so in my own little way. So what I did was I took well-known iconic works by da Vinci and uh, Vermeer and Klimt, and I reinterpreted them but imposed a new meaning and transformed these to a vehicle, like becoming a vehicle to address disability and inclusiveness and normalizing it. 
and I wanted to pick pictures which were easily recognizable. So even if you didn't know about the art or the artist, how they painted it, where it was from, you kind of like, oh, that's a very well-known painting. So, for example, this one is a portrait of Picasso, but this time you notice he's wearing a body brace, similar to what I'm wearing now. Uh, you'll see the girl with the pearl earring, Vermeer. She's not wearing a pearl earring anymore, but she's called a gold oak spine. Uh, this is obviously woman, uh, Klimt's Women in Gold, but you'll notice the orthotics neck collar. So, see, so basically I wanted people to see the pictures and recognize them, but then also engage them, say, look, ah, oh, that's a body brace, that's a splint. Uh, so these paintings is what to show what the disabled community called uh, the social model of disability. So you are disabled because of the laxus, lack of access in the world. So I wanted disability to be very much visible and normalize it through this interplay with art history. So some of these things you can see in these photographs I took from the video of me wearing like the, the arm splint like the Mona Lisa is behind me or the body brace or for example, lung capacity machines and things like this. So look, at the end, when we go to the Q&A, if you wanna see a small clip from the video of this, please put your hand up and we'll, we'll show the clip. In fact, they should see the clip just to see the amazing Bart Simpson jumper in action. I remember I used to be very jealous of that jumper. Um, so Davy, not only have you created sort of physical artworks, but you've also leaned towards embracing new tech to explore issues of accessibility. And you've always been a big advocate of tech since using the BBC Micro. So can you tell us how you use tech to explore accessibility? Yeah, sure, Bob. So look, this is a, a picture of how I, the, my process of painting. So mobility is very restricted for me when I paint because I have to sit on the floor without the body brace. And so what I try to do is I sort of um, create these ad hoc technologies, so for example, sticking um, uh, pencils to the end of paint and brushes and stuff like that so I can move around the canvas easier. So for example, fundamentally for me, technology is about access. And for me and a lot of other disabled people out there, technology enables us to do things we normally can't do because of a social uh, model of disability. For example, the world isn't designed around us. So obviously, there's nothing like coming to the Tate Modern uh, Institution and seeing works in scale, but people with disabilities or people with limited mobility can't always physically travel to access art in, in real life. So I wanted to do something to demonstrate and show people a glimpse of the future for those who can't physically travel to experience art for any number of reasons, health, cost, mobility. So in 2019, before the pandemic, I converted my living with spinal cord injury canvases into a virtual reality short film. So this was to address the access issues of actually physically seeing art. So I put the artworks into a virtual reality short film. So it's not like the real thing, but it's the closest to that we can get. So this kind of medium, like virtual reality, might in the future help uh, sort of uh, make art and culture more inclusive in the future. For example, if you think about what's happened during the pandemic, already remote access of things has become normalized through things like Zoom. So yes, that's, that's it. Mm. In fact, you call this virtual reality um, short film The Cure. So what was the motivation behind that title? I presume it's not the 1970s, 80s rock punk band, The Cure. No, Bobby, no. it wasn't <laughs> motivated by the band. But uh, so, yeah, so I called it The Cure, and I set it in the year 3000. So this is uh, basically, I, I envision by this time, spinal cord injury would be a thing of the past, because some future, technology will be able to fix the spinal cord. So look, here's a screenshot of the short film. Um, so, so look, the short film is set in the future and uh, the future curators find these paintings from the 21st century and then basically they show the audience, the curator show, to show what the audience in the future, how it felt to live with a disruptive injury. Uh, so a little Easter egg. In the VR short film, I intentionally put the viewer lower down so they have to crane their neck to look up at the paintings because that's how it is in, in real life for people with disabilities. Things are not designed around them, right? They're designed around normal heights. And so I wanted to pose the question, uh, is it simply the social model of the world that needs fixing, meaning more access and inclusion? So this is the kind of questions I try to address through my VR experience and art. Yeah, in, like I actually wasn't aware of the um, you know, you put, putting the height at a sort of your level till this conversation recently, so. Yeah, and I never really 
talked about it. I put friends in the VR experience. I went to exhibitions, they're like, they had to crane up. And one friend pointed out to me, Davey, is this from your perspective? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, quite clever. So, you, Davey, you also mentioned uh, Da Vinci inspired, obviously, your spinal injury work, and, of course, other sort of iconic artists in art history. But are there other artists that have inspired your works uh, exploring your spinal injury, and any art perhaps here at the Tate Modern in particular? Yeah, look, Bob, I could talk all day about art that is inspired by works. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> all day. You got the time? Yeah. So exploring my artwork. So uh, again, that's another talk in itself. Uh, but look, I'll stick with one example for today. So Matisse was an artist that lived about, uh, Andre Matisse was an artist that lived about 100 years ago. And uh, when, uh, as he, uh, as he, as in his older years, he had to have an operation. And the operation meant that he became a wheelchair user and his mobility was more restricted. And so he tried to think of other ways of how he could continue creating works of scale, but with less mobility. So what he did was, was very clever. He basically got giant pieces of paper, uh, painted them, and then, and then cut them out, and then put them on the wall with his assistants. So these drawings were called the cutouts. And so this is something I saw at the, um, uh, the, the, the Tate Modern here about eight years ago, actually with a friend of mine in the audience, James, hey James. So, so, and when I saw it, I thought, wow, these are amazing works. So rather than his disability or impairment restricting his creativity, it actually enhanced it. And I think the cutouts is some of the best I've ever seen by Henri Matisse. So, so basically, in a way, his artwork became better after his disability. Mm. And actually, I remember at the opening of your Living with Spinal Cord Injury Exhibition at the Spinal Unit, you actually did something Matisse-inspired there as well, didn't you? That's right, look, so in Greek mythology, there's an individual that flies too close to the sun and the wings are made of wax for some reason, and he falls out of the sky. So look, Matisse did a homage to this. He did a silhouette of a person, uh, a silhouette falling from the sky. And for me, this felt like having a spinal cord injury. So this is when you sort of fall from grace, right? Sort of, then what I did was, um, I, when we opened the Living with Spinal Cord Injury a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic, uh, at Stop Mandeville National Spinal Injury Center, I created uh, what we call a community canvas. So I created a silhouette of Icarus as well. But this time when Icarus fell, there were wheels coming down with him. So life was different, uh, the spinal injury, but it would, would come back with wheels. So like Matisse, what I wanted to show for the spinal, new, newly spinal injured patients that there was life after spinal injury. Mm. And just like Matisse, you just had to think about access issues a little bit more. Yeah, that's really powerful. So we're going to move on to Q&A shortly, but before that, there was a specific quote um, that Davey wanted to share because you feel it reflects the title of your virtual reality series. And it's by the art author B.A. Rifkin. And in this quote, he says, the doctor studies the body to improve its fate, the artist to improve its spirit. Why is this quote so powerful to you? Yeah, Bob, look, we've talked about today about access, uh, about inclusion, about uh, disability, and how it links to my series, The Cure. But really, The Cure doesn't mean fixing disability at all. Mm. It's actually a metaphor. That's why I really like the title. So look, this quote by Rifkin is what I meant by The Cure. It boils down to art and what we all look for when we come to institutions like the Tate Modern. In fact, wherever we're from, whoever we are, I feel that in a way, art can be seen as the cure for the human condition. And that's why I love this quote. Oh, well, um, well, thank you so much, Davy, and thank you for the Tate Modern for allowing us to have Davy's art experience shared with us. So round of applause for Davy, please. Thank you. So we're going to have like 10 minutes for Q&A, but I think we might have time to play your little clip first before we start, so well you can think about some questions. Here's that little clip. I'm going to play now, guys. So this is from the early 90s, I think. So this is like one of the, every annually, had to go for basically, we call it MOT at Children's Week. And so they would assess your brace and all these other things. This is like the caliper back in the day. And your Simpsons jumper, obviously. And my Simpsons jumper. This is measuring lung capacity. Okay. 
You're definitely giving her the side eye, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah, so Scott Mandel, there was a Mona Lisa in the lobby. So I'm guessing <laughs> that's where my love of Da Vinci came from. I didn't even know this until I found yeah. the clip. This is a real one, yes, isn't it? The that's, real a, one. that's a real one, yeah. <laughs> Scott Mandel was very rich. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so are there any questions? I think there should be a mic coming round. Is there a microphone? If you have any questions, just raise your hand and I'll... Um, any questions? Oh, yeah. Oh, one over there. Oh, there's a mic. Yeah, there'll be a mic going on. Yeah, no, so this is a big discussion within the disability world, right? So the point isn't to cure all disabilities because that's how you have like a neurodiversity in society, you lose a lot. But the point is, for example, specifically with a spinal cord injury, so you'll be able to choose whether you want to patch, you know, if you get run over by a car, you fall over or whatever happens, then do you have the technology to, to basically patch yourself up? Because a spinal injury isn't just not being able to walk, but are lots of other side complications that come with it, which some of the paintings actually explore, human anatomy. So, you know, it's not, I don't really care about not walking, but I care about the other issues that the spinal injury causes. And if I can fix that, then that'll be great. And obviously it was a science fiction short film, and I said the cure to make it more interesting. But like I said, the cure is a double word, right? What is the cure, the technology or the art itself? Thank you for the question. Hope that helps. Hey, 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 Dr. Sam. Uh, can I ask, uh, why do you prefer oil rather than water? Like what? what was it that you liked about oil paintings? Sure, that's a really good question. So when I was younger, in Storm Andevu, um, so they gave me like a gouache painting or like, for example, watercolor. So I kind of did that for many, many years. And then when I was a teenager, I discovered oils and I discovered the heritage of oils going back to Da Vinci and before, of, of post Da Vinci, because Da Vinci was kind of one of the first major artists to go from tempera, or, uh, tempera to oil. It was kind of like virtual reality of the age, right? New technology. So like this has got a long history of, of, of artists embracing oils as a major practice. So I felt like I should throw homage to some of the, you know, the artists of hundreds of years. And I started using it. And the point is you can get much more um, uh, stronger contrasts in, in oil versus, versus other mediums. So I'm, I'm going to say, yeah, that's the kind of reason if that makes any sense. But the growing up, we used to play, we used to do watercolor initially, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. So watercolor dries really instantly. And so you cannot keep on reworking it, which is what I do, because it might take months. Um, and so I, when I was working on the community canvas for Storm I was I created the canvas one uh, before and painted it myself to see what the color was, was the correct, and I think I used gouache, and I was surprised how instantly it dried. I was like, this is like writing with ink pen. So it's kind of weird. Uh, but yeah, that's why I like kind of uh, oils. Uh, David, just following that question, obviously technology plays a big role in your life and your uh, professional work as well. How come you don't use digital mediums for art? Said again, I said again. How come you're not using digital mediums for art? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, because you don't upset Hulk me. Said again. You don't upset I don't want to upset, upset Hulk me exactly. I don't want to encroach into his iPad space. But no, actually, funnily enough, when I was in uh, Stormandavu in the late 2000s for operations and stuff, I had that kind of the iPod touch. And I created like a series of paintings just on that little two-inch screen. So I did really enjoy it. And for example, in the future, uh, at the moment, I can move enough to paint oil paintings. But for example, in the future, if my mobility was restricted for whatever reason, then I have a fallback and using digital mediums. So it is there at the back of my mind. And I've created digital works, but I haven't really shown them publicly much. But thank you for the question, I said. Hi, 
Hi there. Um, this gentleman stole my question, but uh, an auxiliary one is, um, have you ever experimented with sculpture? Yeah, so actually that's, so, that's, that's a really good question about future works. So what I'm trying to work on at the moment is, uh, I'm trying to, so basically using, so using going from oil to flat canvases to virtual reality, which is 3D. Uh, and actually I'm filming this talk in virtual reality right here. So it's gonna be in 3D VR. Um, but yeah, so one, one of the things I wanna do is work on um, three dimensional like installations at some point. And so if you can imagine like a skeleton or something with the human anatomy and, and skull. So sculpturing is something I'm, I'm very much uh, looking forward to do at some point. So it's a very pertinent question, maybe in the next year. And Dave, do you remember growing up when we watched Blue Peter, we'd make the sort of 3D models of different <laughs> yeah, things. Exactly. So we used to watch something called Captain Planet. Anyone had a Captain Planet, like a cartoon? <laughs> so we made like a, like a 3D model of Captain Planet. And Timmy Mallet as well. So Bob, that's your early venture into sculpture. Bob, that's your next uh, <laughs> job. Yeah. yeah. Assistant, art <laughs> assistant. I think we've got time for a couple more questions, but after that, Davey, or Davey will be here in the corner over there, and he's got some postcards any free postcards of his artwork if you want to see it as well. So a couple more questions. Uh, Hi, yeah. Um, you talk about the VR technology, and I know that I watched your VR film a couple of years ago, and you touch base on the VR um, project you are doing now. Um, are you going to explore the metaverse and the VR space a bit more, or like uh, the NFT or the Web3 space? Can you tell us about a, bit, a bit about that, please? Yeah, sure. Look, technology always runs through my head, and I follow it very closely. So I will not just use technology because it's there. I will use it if there's a very specific reason, right? So the reason I converted to virtual reality, like I was mentioning, was because people with disabilities cannot travel often, and so they cannot experience this. So now the pandemic has kind of very much normalized this remote thing, but if I can find a link between the story of the artwork and the technology, very much so, that's something I will look into more. For example, things like brain-computer interfaces, how to control things with your mind and things like this, because a lot of the technology used by people with spinal injuries are kind of advanced. For example, people have been using uh, voice, um, uh, voice recognition for, for decades now, but only now it's very normalized on your smartphone through Alexa. But the disabled community are often first movers in technology. So if I can find a link between whatever it is, the technology, and to the story of the artwork, then definitely I will, I will continue embracing it. Thank, Thank you, you. Mikhail, for the question. Thank you. Okay, I think there's one final one, I think just here. Uh, thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you for the talk. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, and I really liked the um, idea you talked about, about uh, social theory of disability and a medical theory, which was kind of new to me. Um, and I, I, was, I was sort of wondering on that, what would you consider to be the social changes that would have to happen for you to uh, uh, sort of feel cured under that theory of what disability is? Yeah, so look, I, I've been to a lot of buildings that are newly designed and, you know, very newly designed, and the access is not that great. I'll give you a very interesting, interesting question. So I was at an opening at a building in Cambridge when I was there back in the day, and Professor Hawking was opening it. And funnily enough, his speech was about how bad access was about some of the newly opened buildings. There were awkward pauses, but Professor Hawking could say it and get away with it. So I would say, when you're designing buildings, um, it's good to involve the disabled community involved with it. So I think from the ground up, not an afterthought by some of the uh, engineers and whatnot. By the way, Professor Hawking was very much um, a backer about uh, access uh, within Cambridge and all over the place. Everywhere I went, he talked about access. So it wasn't just one specific building, but everywhere. <laughs> well, so thank you so much for your question, and thank you much for all your questions as well. Um, and again, a final round of applause. Davey, thank you so much for sharing your story. Davey will be around the corner over there in a second if you want to get, like, I think he's got some postcards of his artwork. Do you want to do, like, a, a group picture? Yeah. Davey's like a 3D, I don't know what's he's doing. 
panoramic picture of you guys. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, come over to the other side if you want to ask me any other questions and get some free uh, art yeah. postcards. Don't ask him why he supports Spurs. That's uh, too long. Yeah. <laughs>
hopefully you can hear me. Hi everyone, I want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Helen, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a white woman in my mid-30s. I have long brown hair and a fringe, and tonight I'm wearing a green jumper with navy trousers and some slightly grimy white trainers. I am the producer of the community program here at Tate Modern, and I'm delighted to be joined by Leah Clements on my left and Amanda Lynch on screen behind me. We are going to be discussing institutional change and artistic access in the cultural sector. I'm going to say a very, very brief few words about Leah and Amanda's practice. It's incredibly rich and multifaceted, so it's tricky to do that in a, in a sound bite. But Leah is an artist based in London, and her practice spans film, performance, writing, and installation, just to name a few. And her work, I'm now quoting you, but it's, it's a perfect summary, is concerned with the relationship between the psychological, emotional, and physical, often through personal accounts of unusual or hard, hard to articulate experiences. And her work also focuses on sickness, crippness, and disability in art more broadly. Amanda is based in Somerset, and she's an artist and curator um, who works, again, in a variety of different mediums, um, from collage and 2D works to sculpture. Her work explores social practice and engagement, and she's also very interested in male art, specifically from the 60s and 70s, archives, and the subject of access and disability. Um, we are going to chat for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to go to questions. So let's dive in with the first question to Leah. I should describe myself first. Of course, go ahead. Um, so I'm Leah, I'm an artist, and I, um, I'm a white woman in my early 30s. I have very dark blonde hair that's pulled back. I'm wearing a black top, um, and I'm wearing some gold jewellery. Um, and my pronouns are she and they. Yeah, sorry, go on. <laughs> Maybe to do a full round, Amanda, would you like to go ahead and describe yourself? Hi everyone, so I'm Amanda and um, I've got black hair pulled back, uh, clear frame glasses and a black t-shirt and my pronouns are she, her. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so the first question I was really keen to ask you is about access art or access docs for artists, which is on screen behind you currently. Yep. But this is a project that you worked on as part of a residency that you did at the Weising Art Centre in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, I was just really intrigued to learn more about the project, how it came to be, and also it's been out in the world now for about three years, so I'm curious mm -hmm. to know about the feedback that you've been receiving mm -hmm. from artists and institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I made it with uh, artist Lizzie Rose and writer Alice Hattrick. And um, yeah, it came, came out of a residency we did at Wising Arts Centre. I think it was 2018, but I might have that wrong. Now I'm doubting myself, but it feels like a while ago now. But um, yeah, we kind of were there together for about a month. Um, and I wanted to just bring everyone together to work out how to even exist in the art world as disabled artists so we were kind of like asking a lot of questions um, of each other and then other artists came to stay or spoke to us online um, especially people who'd been doing it for longer than us and we learned so much from them um, but the thing that we learned that felt that it could be the most uh, helpful and easily shareable thing was um, what an access doc is um, and how to make one and use one, um, which we hadn't heard of before. Um, and it's a document that lists your access needs and um, you can share it with whoever you're working with, particularly obviously if you're an artist. Um, you work with different people all the time. It's not like you're um, an employed person at a salaried position where you um, have the same line ma manager for five years. Um, you might be changing every month. Mm. Um, so to save you from having to describe and explain what your access needs are every single time, um, it's really useful for that. Um, and yeah, you said so that it's been in the world for a few years. Yeah, I mean, the feedback's been kind of amazing really um, I mean it's not I will say it's not necessarily going to work for every single person mm. and we wouldn't say it, it, it would work for every single person and the um, you know you can't guarantee that anyone that you share it with is going to honor it properly or fully um, but yeah we've had so many people get in touch to say that it's helped them which is just like 
really wonderful. I mean, we didn't know when we made it whether it would be helpful. We hoped it would be. We thought it would be. Um, but yeah, I still get people like messaging me saying that it's yeah, <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> Amanda, I'm curious. You've obviously been working in this industry or this sector for a long time, but how you have communicated your needs over the years to institutions, how you've set your boundaries, and how what Leah has just said, you know, resonates with you in the context of your own practice. Um, first off, Leah's work is brilliant, and I actually used um, her setup to do my own access doc. So hats off to you for doing that. <laughs> um, for me personally, I've always tried to have conversations with like galleries or institutions but as I'm sure both of you are, are aware it's really difficult sometimes because you have to put your very vulnerable self in the limelight <laughs> um, but I have learned to try and do that as you know open and honestly as I can um, but that does raise its challenges. Thanks Amanda. On that note you have recently um, completed or worked on a survey with Dash, Dash Arts yeah. about online access and I know you're, well, you're in the process of analysing the data, but you very kindly brought some, some of your initial findings with you today. Um, and again, I was just really keen to learn more about the process of, of entering into that conversation with Dash, why you felt it was important to do the research, and also how the findings are beginning to materialise and what you're hoping to do with them. Yeah, sure. So this project was really spurred on by conversations with other artists um, alongside Dash. So obviously over the duration of the pandemic, we're all stuck at home. Um, we're all in the same lockdown. So we're all in the same boat, so to speak. Um, because the venues and galleries were closed and more programmes were then moved online, uh, it was a fantastic opportunity um, and a great way to showcase exhibitions and talks that this was happening online. But with the reopening of venues, this very quickly but subtly disappeared. So um, I started having conversations um, with people I work with, people at Dash, um, and things were coming up between all of my colleagues saying, you know, I can't visit this talk because it's not being streamed, or I can't have, you know, I can't take part in XYZ because it's there's no Zoom access or any online access to a program. So it could be a course, exhibition or talk. And it was all I was hearing, um, sort of the coming months of venues reopening. So I spoke to Dash that I was in a mentor programme with, and uh, we put this forward, the question of why have online programmes been removed or dramatically reduced to the Tate Plus galleries. Now, this was an extremely difficult conversation to have. Um, we wasn't really getting anywhere. So I decided to set up the survey to put out to all creative people, so artists and creatives, and get their point of view. So the main things I really wanted to try and find out was with the removal of online access to talks and exhibitions, how does this affect an artist creates an artist creativity? And what happens to artists if they don't have access to these things and their access is limited? Um, that were the, they were the key things that I wanted to investigate. So from there, um, obviously, as you can see, these are just some of like the top sort of things that have come up. Um, for me personally, these are really striking data so far. I am just in the early stages of going through the evaluation. I'll just read through these uh, very briefly for you just to give you, give you a summary. So the first question that I asked was, since the start of the COVID-19 pan pandemic, have you visited art exhibitions, talks by galleries online? 96.3% percent people said yes so then I asked since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic have you viewed or experienced more art exhibitions or talks online than you have done previously 83 percent said yes question three has viewing exhibitions and talks online been beneficial for you as an artist 96 percent said yes since the change of the government guidelines and the opening up of the gallery spaces how many exhibitions, talks have you visited in person? None to three, 75%. This is just a snippet. Um, and for me, this is really clear data that accessible content online is, is heavily needed. Um, there's a lot of written answers given um, that are really in depth about why this was needed for different um, disabled people. 
Some mentioned this was travel, rural living, and also economic, along with many other reasons that came into play. There are also some really personal responses that are written, um, but the most common phrase that was used was, I feel left behind. In 83% of the questions, this phrase was used. And I think that just says it all um, for, the, for the survey so far. Um, again, other th things that are mentioned were, you know, others felt um, feeling isolated and depressed and that they haven't made any artwork for four to six months um, because of the, you know, reopening and, and non-access to things. So, yeah, so I think it's just incredibly sad um, data, but I think it's really, really important to talk about this. Thank you, Amanda. One of the, I guess, positive aspects of the pandemic was that it forced us to really reimagine how we were operating. And also, uh, it forced us to acknowledge that you can create change very, very rapidly yeah. if there's huge buy-in. Mm -hmm. um, because I feel like that's something, I don't know what your take is on it, Leah, but you're constantly forced with this, oh, it's huge structural change, it's yeah. going to take years, if not decades. But we saw over the past three years that change can happen rapidly if there is enough pressure. Yeah, and well, and if the right people need it, because I think a exactly. lot of disabled people are pretty found it pretty painful at the same time as um, exciting when stuff moved online. You know, there were like disabled students who ha couldn't go to university because they asked for their lectures to be streamed online or recorded, and they were told that that wasn't possible, and mm. then suddenly it was possible. <laughs> yeah, but just as an example, um, it's like when it's abled people that need it, then then we can do it. Mm. <laughs> One of the things I really wanted to talk to both of you about this evening was like completely new frameworks for experiencing arts. I mean, we obviously all know the exhibition model well, the display model well, but there are alternatives out there. I mean, me and Amanda have had great conversations about male arts, <laughs> um, but also Nets Arts, Apartments Art, there are all of these movements from the 60s, 70s, 80s, like examples of ways that people have pushed back against the standard, the mainstream male art. You know, particularly it sidesteps those mainstream distribution and approval processes. It, you know, rejects the art market, the art gallery. Um, but I know that you've been doing huge amounts of work on this, Amanda, and I was really keen for you to tell us more about your restrictions exhibition, which opened, was it last year at Cahill Arts? It did, yeah. So um, 2021, I don't know where that year has gone. Um, so restrictions exhibition is um, archived at Cahill Arts. So what you're seeing here, it's a letterpress unit that contains 10 trays. So there were 200, over 200 artists involved and there's over a thousand miniature pieces of work. So this work ranges from anywhere between the size of a postage stamp, the largest being like a, an old school Nokia phone. <laughs> it's like the, that sort of size. And this was open to everyone. Um, anyone from self-taught emerging artists through to professional, between and beyond that. Um, anyone could apply. Even though the theme was restriction, there were no restrictions in applying. You just had to send me your info and you got in. I purely had to close the open call because I ran out of room, which I never thought was ever going to happen, <laughs> um, which is brilliant. Um, but yeah, I didn't think that's going to happen. Um, this is all based on mail art. So the work had to be shipped to um, Clay Hill Arts. We were in the high highest point of the pandemic as well, which added slight complication to displaying of the artwork and with this work each tray is its own collective so it has over 25 artists in each tray and as you can tell just from these pictures is that there is no um, name tags or any labeling of any kind and this was really done on purpose so each tray has an even number of self-taught emerging disabled and professional artists in each tray and I wanted to ask the viewer can you tell who is who can you tell who the emerging self-taught artist is? Can you tell who disabled artist is? Can you tell who the professional artist is? I personally don't think so. And I'd love to hear everyone else's opinion. Do you want to respond, Leah? Uh, I don't know about that no specific pressure. question because <laughs> I haven't had a chance to look at it properly. But, um, but I imagine you're right, Amanda. Um, yeah, I don't know. I was thinking as well, just because we were talking about um, different ways of um, sharing exhibitions, um, and I know that this work is online as a series of videos as well. So there's, it's not just like you have to be there to see it either. Do you know what I mean? Because <laughs> so, I think otherwise then that would be another potential point at which it would stop. But, um, but it isn't. It's been documented in this really nice way. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. I, there's something really nice as well just about like receiving stuff in the post. It must have been quite a lovely process for you, like just getting things in the mail. Yeah, so I am really active in my own mail arts practice, um, but Deborah Parks at Clay Who Arts, she had, I guess, the privilege but also daunting oh, right. task of receiving all of the parcels right. <laughs> um, while I was uh, creating the whole exhibition from home. Um, that's purely because like, obviously we were in a lockdown at the time. Mm. So logistical planning was, was a biggest challenge because this exhibition should have been in person. Was the remote, I mean, obviously you've gone through the process of, of curating an entire show start to end remotely, but do you want to unpack that a little bit more, the challenges, but also the, I mean, the positive elements of that, Amanda? Well, it shows what you can do online. I mean, yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> this is true. Yeah, it was a really amazing experience. Like Leah, you mentioned, um, obviously I've got videos of each tray. There's like a pan view. Um, we did our live event. Um, we streamed that on YouTube. I tried to make it as accessible as possible because I knew people couldn't visit in person. You can go and visit in person um, now, but the crux of the work is online. Um, it really was difficult trying to create a show online, especially I hadn't ever seen the letterpress drawers. I'd just seen images. So, you know, mapping all of this out and allocating the artists was a task, but I loved it, to be quite honest. Thank you, Amanda. Leah, on the note of, well, you, you referred to it gently there, but on um, kind of alternative ways of working, you are really interested in image captioning, BSL, and auto, also audio description as a critical practice. Mm. Um, so not just as a way to open up an artwork, but as the basis of the artwork itself, which I think is so fascinating that these things are incredibly unique and it's a, you know, it's a different type of experience depending on how you approach it. I was really keen to learn a little bit more about how you see those kind of, almost like as mediums, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they should also be provided in that kind of like basic way mm. um, for people who need to um, use them. But... Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I've been making photographic work much more over the last year or two and um, alongside that image description, so describing what's there for anyone who is blind, visually impaired or needs it or prefers it for any other reason. Um, but then, so, so yeah, you can do like a very short, clear description and that's like needed. Um, you can go further than that and you can do a more detailed description or I'm kind of really interested in um, taking and running with this idea um, put forward by um, Shannon Finnegan um, which is alt text as poetry so um, turning that into like a work itself as a poetic work that's like a core part of um, the photographic work um, and I think that it, it does have that capacity to be um, well, aesthetic in itself, like I think um, one thing I'm really interested in at the moment is um, reweirding it, like yeah. that thing of jamais vu, like um, the opposite of deja vu. So when you something that's really normal to you, you encounter it in a way that makes it seem really unusual and strange. Like if you're having to describe an image in a lot of detail, it's kind of weird. <laughs> it makes it surreal. See, yeah, it re like yeah. reweirds it. But I think it also does have that critical capacity um, because you're doing a close reading effectively of the image and you're kind of paying it the kind of attention you would in a, in a crit, for example, mm. um, and really like analysing it. So I think there's like so much room to explore there. Um, so <laughs> you want me to move on to that? No, no, no. Oh my God, no. Sorry. I was, I was wondering okay. if you needed me to move on to it. I was like, there's eye contact here, but yeah. not the right type of eye contact. <laughs> Oh God, no, but um, I mean, I guess, I guess to respond a little bit before we move on to the next image, um, the video that you created to represent the kind of physical experience mm -hmm. um, was obviously extraordinary, but it was just to, to speak to what you're saying. Um, I watched it twice, once with my eyes closed, once with my mm -hmm. eyes open, and you're spot on. The experience with my eyes closed felt like an, a completely different thing me having to try to visualize what you were describing versus me seeing it on screen. It was like two completely different experiences and it made me really realize the potential that audio description has. And like, yeah, I mean, I'm, you're, you're way more <laughs> coherent in the way that you're describing your, your no, the work. I, but I mean, I've put a lot it, of work um, into it. 
it, it feels like there's huge potential there with something yeah. to explore in a serious way definitely moving forward yeah no I, yeah so i should say so this <laughs> is a photo of um my exhibition the siren of the deep which was at um eastside projects last year um and it's got this pool in the middle um which is a freestanding pool which is draped in white fabric and lit very brightly by a spotlight but there's darkness in the background except for a warm glowing light on a indistinguishable hard to see object um so this exhibition was time-based, so it ran on an audio track and a loop of lighting. Um, so kind of taking photos wouldn't have done it justice as a representation of the work in a like, kind of standard way. Um, so I decided to make a film of the work. Mm. So for access reasons, for disability access reasons, people who can't make it for, for that, but also you know, access as a broader thing of like economic access, people can't afford to go places or have the day off work or whatever, um, for all those reasons. But so it's not an attempt at representing the exhibition exactly as it was, but more like if this exhibition were a film, what would that look like? So it does things that you, you couldn't do in the exhibition, like you mm. go into the pool um, <laughs> and look upwards through the water which obviously you couldn't do in the real exhibition. Um, and then it has these like other aesthetic concerns, like it, it transitions from the first part, um, which is like on kind of phone footage, kind of pixelated, blurry, and then there's a moment um, of transcendence halfway through, and then the image becomes like very clear. Um, so it's like very invested in the fact of it being a film work, mm. not just replicating what was there, because you can't do that. Um, and then, yeah, so it sounds like you listened to the audio described one because there's yeah. a subtitled one, an audio described one, and a um, what's the third one? Um, captioned one that um, describes the sound. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and each of them felt entirely different. That was mm. the most. Um, that was the most staggering thing. I felt like I had three completely different experiences, mm. but it was all hooked on to this moment. And yeah, the, the potential is huge. Um, but as we're running out of time, my final <laughs> question, sadly, and hopefully this might um, spark some questions from the audience as well. Tonight's event is programmed in collaboration with Dash. And at the beginning of this month, they staged an incredible event um, called We Are Invisible, We Are Visible, where 31 um, deaf, neurodivergent and disabled artists staged interventions at 30 plus state venues across the country. And it was an incredible moment, a real moment of collective action. It felt powerful and an opportunity for disabled artists to make visitors, make institutions aware that the social barriers, the structural barriers that um, we're you know, trying to break down are still very much there. Um, but the question I had for you specifically was about the classification of artists, I suppose. Mm -hmm. This is something that I think happens quite often within institutions. Um, in a bid to spotlight someone's work or the work of an artist that's often overlooked. They tend to be forced into categories, you know, women or a category based on their race or disability. And in the context of Wave Out, it made total sense. It was actually really, really successful, I think, to, to band all of those people together. Um, but it can also be, I think, quite restrictive to minimize someone's identity in that way to mm. limit it to one thing so i was curious to know from both you and amanda how you feel about the classification of artists in that way and if you've had positive or negative experiences if it's something that concerns you yeah definitely um do you mind if i go first amanda or? No, go, go for it, go for it <laughs> um yeah i think both it can be positive and negative and i agree um for an organization like dash whose whole mission is um uh, helping platform disabled artists, it makes total sense for that grouping to exist, um, especially because they do do the work behind the scenes to support those artists, um, you know, like meeting their access needs, and they do things like um, create development uh, opportunities and things like that. I think one of the ways that that sort of grouping can become problematic is when it's an organisation that is featuring that term or that grouping that category very prominently in their like 
marketing or text on it and they're not doing that work behind mm. the scenes. Mm. Um, so those artists who, if we, yeah, if we're talking about disability, if there's a group of disabled artists on a project who, um, whose names and work are being used to signify this idea of progress, but um, the progress isn't actually happening and they're dealing with the fallout of that behind the scenes, then who is that categorization benefiting? Because mm. it's not benefiting the disabled artists, it's just benefiting um, the image of the institution or organization. Um, I think another time it can become tricky is like, even if your access needs are really supported, it depends on like who you are and where you're at and um, like who you're working with on an organizational level, but also on a personal level. But I think sometimes like being asked to just talk about your disability and not your artwork in an art context as an artist can be pretty rough. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, like you might be making work that is really directly related to disability. Mm. You know, like for me, um, I don't consider Access Docs for Artists artwork, it's, it's my work, but um, that's on one end of something very practical. Um, and then the other end, you've got that, which is like astronauts and water and like. <laughs> Maybe I want to talk about how, what water looks like when light's shining on it. Um, but wherever your work falls within that scale, being invited as a disabled artist to make work or talk about your work without the pressure of it having to be one thing is really important. And then once that work's made, can we have a conversation around the um, formal and aesthetic properties of the work and treat it as artwork and not just um, you're only here because of <laughs> because of that um, yeah and that feels really important to me thank you <laughs> Amanda would you like to to comment um, yeah well That's firstly I just I, yeah I totally agree with what Leah said um, I was going to bring up some of those points Leah's already covered I mean for me personally um, I rarely say that I'm a disabled artist only where it's relevant um, I think sometimes it's all as Leah said for the personal you know um, person uh, it can be really difficult to openly say I'm disabled artist because then some institutions just want to focus on that um, and it can become a bit of a tick box system um, that has happened to people I know of as well with with the labeling category that's where I think it can be a bit dangerous um, for some institutions. Um, but yeah, I, I won't comment too much because I know have time, but I basically agreed with everything Leah said. She said it very well. <laughs> we do have time for questions, and I know there's a roaming mic if anyone's keen to, um, to ask anything of Leah or Amanda in this moment. <laughs> no pressure, I do have more questions. <laughs> Maybe take a minute to think about it. I'm going to ask one more while I have my chance, and then we'll come back to you. But I guess as I have more time, um, something else that I've been worrying about or thinking about a lot lately is the, well, I suppose the impact of the pandemic on, on arts funding. Mm -hmm. um, as everyone knows, there's been so many cuts across the board, um, not specifically within the arts, but we're, we're definitely taking a beating. And when there tends to be funding cuts, the first thing that goes is things like BSL, mm. audio description. And I guess I was curious to know from both of you, um, if, you're, you know, if you have serious concerns about that, if there's something that we as a group should collectively be doing to like push back, um, if there are any strategies that are out there in the ether that we in this moment can kind of put on the table now. It, again, it's a big question. Yeah. And I, I invite everyone to respond if you do have a response. Yeah, I wish I had the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, too much. I was expecting too much from you. No, I just wish I knew how to solve that problem. But I mean, yeah, of course it's, it's worrying um, and frustrating and people are obviously like dealing with it already. I mean, I think we weren't, we were already not really there with things like BSL being provided and there still needs to be a huge culture shift which mm. had begun to happen and maybe is being Slowly. impeded by that but I don't think it's just um, that recent um, cut in funding that's that's the problem um, obviously it will contribute though yeah yeah, yeah. and then I, again I know it's a huge question so no pressure but 
Um, yeah, I definitely think attitudes need to change, especially around things like BSL. It should just be a norm and it isn't at the moment. Mm. And it's the projects I've worked on uh, with other organisations as well. It always seems a bit of an add on. And it's like, oh, we need to stretch the funding. That that shouldn't happen. That mm. that needs to be a cultural shift, as you've mentioned, and just totally eradicated. I do not know what the answer is for that, but if we can all get some placards and come together, I'd be up for it. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? I'm friendly. <laughs> <laughs> Despite our newscaster esque appearance. <laughs> yeah, or if anyone has a question afterwards, like, yeah, yeah feel free me. to I pop know up. That, like, sometimes it can be a bit daunting. All right, well, in that case, I think we're going to wrap up. And yeah, there's plenty more to see across the building. I know that Anahita Harding, who also took part in WayWav, is on level two. And uh, Christina Lovey is performing in the Natalie Bell building, I think. So yeah, feel free to dive into both of those performances. And thank you so much for coming.
Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Um, we are about to start our art chat. So do come on through, grab a seat, grab a cushion, make yourselves comfy. Um, we'd love to introduce these incredible artists, Chris and Poppy. Um, but I think it might be more fitting if uh, handed over for them to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit more about who you are, what you do, your artistic practice, and what we're going to be talking about tonight a bit more. Let's, let's bring in Poppy first. This is a bit, this feels a bit awkward, but um, Poppy, can everyone see okay? Hello. Good, cool, cool. I can't see anyone, but I'm here. <laughs> Um, shall I introduce myself now? Can you hear? Yep, we can hear you. You're all clear to us. Everyone good? <laughs> Poppy, tell us about your work. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for letting me join in this hybrid way. It's very exciting. Um, so I'm a visual artist uh, based between um, kind of South England and Scotland um, and most of my work is textile based and I used to do a lot of screen printing like hand screen printing but since the pandemic I've like moved into a more digital realm and getting really excited about digital textiles mainly digital print and digital embroidery. Fantastic thank you and Chris? Hello hi everyone well I'm Christopher Samuel I make work about disability and identity politics, mainly come, well, echoing my lived experience, kind of interrogating my understanding of my evolving kind of identity. Uh, I use humour, kind of agency, to, to respond to various different topics. Uh, multidisciplinary, so sculpture, uh, video, screen printing, illustration, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Um, and as a brief introduction, my name is Liat um, and I run the Tate Lates. So usually I'm very much behind the scenes, um, but tonight I couldn't really uh, resist the the opportunity to, to be part of this conversation. Um, we've been having quite a lot of chats um, about art and inclusion and access and all of the different practices, but I think the one thing that really um, united a lot of the conversations that we've been having is, that, is um, the subject of care and um, how we bring care into your artistic work, how we engage with audiences, um, and I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that. I thought it would be a good point to start with, the kind of politics of care. And um, I thought, Chris, if we could start with you, because this work is, is quite incredible, and it's very small print. So <laughs> you might have to um, give us a little bit more so, info of what it's all about. So the work is titled Cared For Network, and I was commissioned as part of a group of other artists to to respond to making a piece of work that will be shared via a peer-to-peer -peer network. So a peer-to-peer -peer network is a private network that you can send messages and data through anyway. So I decided to make a piece of work based on the logbooks that my carers keep. Um, on a daily basis, but I wanted to change the kind of narrative because traditionally they'll write a set of things, but they're not really locking what's really happening. So I wanted to write a more honest encounter, kind of of what happens, um, kind of just highlight the kind of dynamics of the power dynamics of a prescribed care relationship um, but also to get people to think about what it feels like to, to, to kind of have your 
power taken from you based on someone's perception of what they feel is right for you. Um, so the work is quite playful. If you, which one's on the screen? It's screens just there, Children. so that's what's every, what everyone's seeing. Could you go to the other one? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So can everyone, can you see that? Yeah. So it's a general record log book. So it's quite mundane in terms of, huh? got Chris up there. So they don't call you by your name. It's your initials. So I've got CS up at 8 o'clock. Well, they just banged my door open, yanked the blinds open, um, kind of grunted at me. Various different things, but not one carer. This was a series of different carers. But I just wanted to highlight how impersonal and how uh, disabling it is in certain kind of cared relationships. Um, it's quite playful, but it's very serious. It's not a kind of isolated incident. This is happening across the board, and that's down to carers being paid not that much. A lot of them not having that great uh, qualifications, they're not trained well, um, care companies are telling them to care for multiple people, into, well, back to back, so at the end of that, the person who's kind of taking the impact is the person who's receiving the care, so I wanted to kind of speak on that, because I can, and I think mm -hmm. a lot of people in my or similar positions maybe can't. They don't have the kind of the voice to to speak on these things. So it's quite literal, but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. quite important. And what's what's been the um, the response to this work? Um, shock. Shock. <laughs> shock. I think as you read, there's a series. I did it for one week. Um, but I wrote, sorry, so I wrote these vlog books from the perspectives, perspective of the carers as though if they, as if they were writing an honest account. Mm -hmm. But people have said to me, um, that's happened to me before, mm -hmm. um, that's quite shocking. Um, they should be working as a carer. Um, where, where the kind of boundaries, where, you know, just general things that I kind of knew about, but, and also people who have no experience with what it's like to have that experience, are quite shocked. Mm -hmm. So. It's important to make it do. visible, yeah. yeah. Um, and let's move on. So Poppy, this work is pretty impressive. Care curtains. Can you, can you tell us about it? Where, where was this? This was displayed at the Lighthouse Review Gallery, is that right? Yeah, so this is at the Lighthouse in Glasgow, um, which is kind of like the design, architecture and design centre. Um, so I kind of had this idea like, rattling around my brain for a long time um, I think I don't know I kind of mainly made this these curtains for my mom I think um, it's like I so when I was on residency I so this project is all about like unofficial carers so it's those people who were like very close to you um, in your immediate circle and I wanted to look at our economy of care and kind of free labor so I, I spoke to about, I think, 50 people um, kind of who live very closely with someone who's got a disability, a health condition or a chronic illness and kind of spoke with them and like was speaking about their role. And I don't know, like it was like, I don't know what I thought I was going to find, but what I found was like a lot more like beautiful uh, and like 
admirable than I ever really realized. It was like all just like messages of love, basically. Um, and these curtains were like, the way I printed them was kind of the parts of the different parts of identity of the people that I was interviewing. So the kind of more clear, obvious parts of their identity were like, are much easier to read and much more visible. And then the closer you get, like you really have to get so close to some of them because they're like centimeter big. I like the more um, secretive and daring and scary parts of their answers about how the experience made them feel. Um, yes, that was this project. It's, um, it's such an impressive work, but it's also so incredibly intimate. Mm. What was um, what were some of the responses that you had when you displayed this? It was it was really emotional, actually. It was like I think also because it was in a public gallery, the pe a lot of people just came across it who weren't like ready, mm -hmm. or weren't expecting it maybe, and like who maybe had that experience themselves. Mm -hmm. um, who were like quite taken aback, I think. And it was, yeah, it was really emotional. And it was like really, for me personally, I got to interview some of my family members. So that was like, that was like a really special um, time for me personally to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And like a feeling as well. Okay. We'll move on. So um, this, this is, um, it's quite funny to show this um, piece in, in this space, because it was actually, uh, this photograph was taken here. Um, the space was um, formerly the Tate Exchange. Um, and the reason why I wanted to show these works is that, um, you know, popular practice, it's, it's so clear that textiles is a core part of it, but text as well, words. And, and we've been talking quite a lot about language and the words we use and, and the power in them. Um, but I thought it'd be really interesting for, for people to hear some of the research that went on um, with No More Pity. Um, so yeah, that was this was in the Tate Exchange and we did a workshop and I was like, I was responding, so NDACA, which is the National Disability Arts Collection Archive, um, they like archived the whole disability arts movement and disability rights movement and like the creativity involved in that. Um, and I responded to that collection and the thing that I loved so much was the t-shirts and the protest t-shirts. So on the, on the right, you can see, so these are the original t-shirts here. And then I kind of recreated them because I wanted at the Tate Exchange to recreate this kind of set this kind of feeling of like the night before the protest or the kind of that fuzzy energy of everyone working together to create the things in order to go go forth into the protest um, and I really like the t-shirts because they're so like they're, they're humorous and they're like they're just like naughty and they're funny and and yeah, I think they're really good. So so this was the workshop that we did where I made these t-shirts and we put them on display. And then throughout the weekend, we spent time with the public and invited them to create their own slogans for t-shirts and protest placards and badges and sort of memorabilia for protest. And then we've also got disability rights, the human rights. Was that so can you, what's the, what's the connection between your sort of participative practice and the creation of these works? So this, I was then, because of NDACA was um, kind of, so it was, it was the political movement in the 1890s of, um, it was like a really radical movement of disability rights activists fighting for their rights and it did so much great change. And um, so it was recognized. So the National Disability Arts Collection Archive, which was Dulan Daka, um, was celebrated and seen as a real art movement and a real like change 
And in 2019, there was a celebratory event at the House of Lords, which I was invited to make a piece of art for. And this dress is the piece of art that I made for the event, which I wore, um, which I took the slogans from the T-shirts from the movement, printed them on this dress and wore them back into uh, you know, the government building, the House of Lords, where the work that was being testified against was then also now seen as a celebration. So I really enjoyed making this piece of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we go here, Chris, you use text in a very different way. Lots of sort of found text, letters, emails, things like that. Do you want to t talk us through this piece? Because there's, there's two, there's, a, there's this and there's the response. Yeah. Lots, screen print, is that right? Yeah. 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 Lots of areas blank. T t talk us through it all. Um, so I suppose I should give you context first. Um, why I use the text. Mm. I think for me, text has always been a, a barrier for me. It's not something I enjoyed, uh, partly because it was never a positive thing, and by that I mean um, I had bad school, schooling, I didn't go to a school that taught me anything academic, um, but also it was text, the way I see text is always seems to be weaponized mm. against me and other people who need. Um, so first memory is my mum. I remember my mum writing letters to ombudsman and social services and different local authorities to kind of fight. She was my advocate, kind of my activist. Um, but she kind of reclaimed that and had a voice. So for me, it's just like a natural progression, but I'm always responding to something that pisses me off. <laughs> um, and this is part of a string of emails, over 200 emails when I was fighting to live independently. I was being forced into a care home. Um, so I took the emails, and reclaimed it, redacted, redacted out sensitive information. Um, but also just to show people how complex um, and the jargon used which alienates everybody, and particularly those who are in a position that at that certain moments need kind of support. Um, they're basically using the laws against us or individuals. Um, so for me it's all, all, always about kind of trying to decipher and understand what the text is, then responding to that. So the next slide is me kind of redacting out everything. And there's my voice in this. At, at what point during the 200 email exchange did you decide that you were going to make something creative out of this? Was it kind of at the beginning or was it kind of after it was all sort of put to bed that you thought, I'm going to use that as material? No, this, this, was, this was while, while it was happening. I, while it was happening? Yeah, I thought this is... Perfect. Prior to that, um, I, for a long time in my life, I kind of shied away from being, not shied away, I rejected anything to do with being disabled or being labeled disabled. But that came a point where mm. I was navigating the real world for myself. Uh, and I wasn't having any of it, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, this, 
next piece is actually, you know, it's, it's one of my personal favourites. Can I, so talk us through it, but I, I want to show everyone this, this is just incredible. Talk, I don't, uh, talk us through Welcome In. So I don't think the pictures does it, it gives, does it justice. And so the Welcome In is a sleeping installation that you can book a night in a functioning hotel. Is this still, so we could all book a night in this hotel yeah, now? Yeah, So this is in Blackpool. So we were, there was an opportunity to write a proposal mm -hmm. to design a room. And I thought, okay, prior to this, I had been living in a hotel for three months, a room that was labelled accessible, slept in a wheelchair, had to use a bucket, to use a toilet, and so on. Um, tried various different rooms that was supposed to be accessible. But what I noticed, and what I knew anyway was, hotels are not a place where I look forward to going to, like many other disabled people, with various degrees of um, disabilities. Um, so I proposed to make a room that was inaccessible for able-bodied people. Uh, That's brilliant, look at that. Uh, it's just genius. So when I sent them the proposal, they were excited, but they were like, I don't think we can do this legally. <laughs> because, <laughs> um, for instance, the door, I told, I told the, um, what they call it? My mind's gone blank. The guys who were kind of furnishing the room, I told them the door needs to be jammed behind the toilet mm -hmm. so it can't shut. And they said, we can't do that. <laughs> and they did it the opposite way. And I said, the sink is not the right height. But what was interesting was they were going by a generic kind of one size fits all. And that's my point. Mm -hmm. It's not about grab rails and wider doors. That doesn't, mm -hmm. there's, there's more to it. Um, so that was really interesting in terms of constantly being pushed back and saying, no, we don't think we can do this. Actually, if we don't do it, the work is void mm -hmm. for me. Um, so the shower, you can't reach the shower itself, reach the shower jar dispensary is upside down. Um, is he selling it into you uh, as a place to stay? <laughs> there's, there's no Wi-Fi in the room. Uh, the bed itself is the scale. I scaled it to the average person's height. Everyone's different heights. So it's difficult to get in, difficult to get out. The table, the table and the chair are flush, so you can't sit um, under the table. The telly's in an alcove. Uh, the lamps, bedside lamps are not usable. Uh, but people thought it was kind of hilarious at first. But after two, three nights, mm -hmm that slowly changed mm -hmm. and the kind of the penny dropped and they realised actually being in a space that's not designed for you is, it's not fun, it's not nice. Mm. Um, so it, it done its job. And this is something we've been talking about a lot around space and I, I want to sort of bring it to um, this work here by Poppy, The Art of Dying 2.0, which is, um, I think, obviously better for you to explain, but it's, um, we've been talking about this sort of wider, this wider discussion around spaces that are um, accessible, spaces that are difficult to navigate, spaces, um, you know, in which certain voices uh, are not made visible. And I think um, there's been a lot of discussion around space in light of the pandemic specifically. Um, would, you, would you be able to tell us a bit more about this work, Poppy? And also, I'm just going to flick, because the embroidery here is just absolutely exquisite here like look at this detail 
it's just incredible. But Poppy, talk us through it all. So I made this, this is the only thing I've made, well, it, it took me a while, but it was the only thing I made since the pandemic. Um, but before the pandemic, I did a research residency at the Welcome and I um, kind of briefly, I made a bedspread, um, which was like um, inspired by one of the medieval manuscripts, um, specifically a manuscript that was focusing on like how to die well. Um, and a lot of the images had like a man dying in bed surrounded by worldly things um, and gold and, and gifts and things like this and demons. Um, so I, after that research residency, I made a bedspread, like a bedspread version of the book. So kind of like a female version of the book. So I was looking a lot about the theme of kind of chronic illness and rest and safety, but also like not wanting to stay in your bed. Um, and then the pandemic happened um, and I didn't do any work for like a year and a half uh, or a year. Um, and then after that, I started thinking about making work again. And this was the, the first thing that I came to. So although it doesn't look like a bedspread, to me, it is a bedspread. Um, and like, I basically just blew the idea of a bed and that all of the same themes I was talking about before. And while I was a vulnerable patient during the pandemic, the same ideas of the bed just like blew up and became the same ideas of the of the flat for me the flat that I was um basically stuck in the government had told me to stay in and that's why I see this as a bedspread because this fabric is the exact same perimeter as the flat that I was in um in the pandemic um so it's 95 meters long um and the way I wanted to document it was so that it was accessible for people who were still unable to, at the time that it was shown, still unable to leave their houses. So we borrowed the technology from estate agents and the kind of 3D cameras that you can like now buy flats and houses with this kind of stuff. So you can, you can go into this piece of art and you can zoom through it as if you're looking at a flat. Um, so that's what this still is taken from. It's incredible. And we can view this online, can't you? You yeah. can go and have like a proper tour around that space. Yeah, viewing, yeah. Um, I'm afraid to say that this is where we will need to draw our art chat to a close. Um, it's the end of the Tate Late. Um, we would um, normally love to open up to um, questions, um, however, um, I really just wanted to ensure that we gave enough time and space so that the artists could really talk in depth about their practice, which I think is just so important to do. Um, we could have this conversation four times over before you know, we ran out of things to say at least. So um, I just want to just extend the biggest thanks to Poppy. Um, and to Chris for joining us and to all of you for being here tonight. Thank you all so much. Right, Chris, we need to get you off, don't we?